As we're here in this very, very beautiful place, I want to acknowledge the land that we're on. Um, this is a place that for thousands of years, um, cultural and spiritual traditions of the first peoples who lived here thrived. Um, this was uh, near a village center, actually. Um, there was uh, trade uh, from this place. As you know, the ocean is very nearby to us. Um, harvest of blue camas and trade of blue camas. Um, it was a place uh, where people lived and uh, prayed and uh, loved the land. And we here at St. George's are in our own process of uh, seeking to walk uh, the path of reconciliation with integrity, honoring the first peoples who once thrived on these lands and learning how to walk in a new way together. So I just acknowledge all those who came before us who lived in this place and who lived in a real harmony with the land. And we acknowledge that we need to learn from them and uh, walk in the way that they walked. I'm going to offer a prayer to start us out in a good way. Holy One, we give thanks for our many, many blessings, for the beauty of this place, for the opportunity to gather as a community and learn about how we can live in the world as justice seekers and peacemakers and how we can love and honor this beautiful earthly home. And we give thanks for all of those among us who are helping us to acknowledge the ecological crisis we're in, but also who are helping us to have hope and helping us uh, learn how we can take concrete action to live in a sustainable way. Amen. It's a great pleasure for me today to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Matt Murphy. He is an Associate Professor of Sustainability and Strategy at UVic. Um, he has a great deal of experience both in the area of research but also in the area of financial services. He spent 12 years in the financial services industry uh, before he was in academia. Um, currently, he teaches in sustainability and strategy at UVic, but he brings all of that prior experience, I think, into his current uh, role. Um, some of the things that he's done, um, in 2008, he co-founded the social enterprise Proudly Made in Africa. It's a UK and Ireland-based nonprofit organization. He's also served on its board of directors for 10 years. Um, in his role at UVic in 2016, he coached a team of MBA students who won the Business for a Better World case competition at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And the proponent of this competition, which the Norwegian government pension fund Global, had asked portfolio uh, competitors to come up with a portfolio that would have these objectives. Minimize the carbon footprint of the fund, reduce risks that might strand assets, maximize returns and engagement impact with companies, and position the fund to thrive and, and drive a world that does not exceed an average two degrees temperature increase. So he is here to share with us about how we can be sustainable investors and how uh, when we want to be responsible in the way we invest, how there actually are tools to do that and we have guidance for that. And he's going to offer that to us now. Welcome. What I'm going to talk about today um, related to sustainable investing is also what I teach my MBA students about. But they will spend about 35 to 40 hours over the course of a semester doing work related to this. So you're getting the condensed version uh, very much. Um, but I do think it'll allow you to understand the, the basic things that, that anyone should know if they're interested in, in sustainable investing. Um, I'm going to start with some, some definitions. There's a lot of jargon in this area. So I'm going to do a bit of jargon busting up front. 
Um, and then I'm going to move straight to answering the question that many of you probably have when you think about sustainable investing, which is, what's the trade-off? What's, what happens to your profitability if you try to do sustainable investing? Um, and then I'm going to show you some, some evidence about this um, from some of the highest quality research and, and recent research on the relationship between sustainability performance and financial performance. Um, I'm going to then show you the metrics or how we can find the metrics that are used for evaluating sustainability performance. Um, and then I'm going to show you an example um, of how this can all be put together into a sustainable investment strategy. And I'm going to use the framework that our MBA students proposed that won that competition at the World Economic Forum on sustainable investing um, that, that you just heard about. And I've got quite a few supplementary slides with just more information about these same topics and more detailed information at the end of the presentation. So if we have time for that, we might go into that, or you're also able to take these slides away and, and explore that on your own later. So starting with jargon, um, the, the term sustainability is very common, um, but um, actually in, in the business and, and uh, financial world and the regulators who oversee the, this industry, the, the term ESG is used more com commonly, and that refers to environmental, social, and governance. Um, together, the environmental, social, and governance performance of, of an organization makes up its sustainability performance. But we can look at their environmental, social, and governance impacts uh, individually. Um, sustainable investing is any approach to investment that includes environmental, social, and governance factors along with financial factors in making investment decisions. So it, it's a very broad uh, definition and many different approaches to sustainable investment can fall under that definition. Um, and then you're going to hear me use a term a lot today, materiality. Um, so I want to explain what I mean by materiality up front. Materiality is a term used um, in investment circles and by regulators basically to mean anything that a reasonable investor might want to know about when making decisions about what to invest in or um, whether or not they should hold a particular investment that they already have. So anything could include environmental, social, or governance factors that might impact uh, a firm and its, and its profitability in the short, medium, and long term. Um, so for example, um, if, if you're a, a coal, uh, coal mining company and you know that the, the government has agreed to eliminate subsidies for coal and has agreed to the Paris Climate Accord to reduce emissions um, to, uh, to uh, prevent global warming beyond one and a half or two degrees Celsius, then these environmental uh, issues and the way that governments and regulators are responding to them uh, might impact the, the financial viability of your coal mining company. So that what seems to be uh, uh, an, kind of an external issue with the environment very much can become a, a, an important financial issue for the firm. Um, so for a coal mining company, particularly carbon emissions issues um, related to the environment are material financial issues as well for, for investors to be concerned about. Um, so this idea of sustainable investment has really grown dramatically over the last 15 years or so. Um, and this chart shows you how much money is being invested in some type, one type or another, of sustainable investment around the world. And those numbers here are trillions. 30, we're talking 30, uh, well, 30.6, almost 30.7 trillion dollars is held by uh, sustainable investment funds in 2018. Now remember, that definition is very broad. I don't want to give the impression 
that all of these funds are actually sustainable. But to one degree or another, funds totaling over $30 trillion do incorporate environmental, social, and government's performance of, of so, to some degree or another into their investment decision making. Um, there are basically seven different uh, approaches or strategies to sustainable investing. Um, and uh, usually a sustainable investor uses some combination of these strategies. Um, so the first is negative or exclusionary screening. And about investors managing almost $20 trillion use, use this as at least one of their strategies. And what that means is just excluding investments in certain industries and in certain types of firms. So it's very common to exclude tobacco, pornography, weapons, and more and more uh, firms or investment firms are starting to exclude fossil fuel or sometimes just some segment of the fossil fuel industry like coal. Positive or best in class screening, it refers to identifying the, the most important and material ESG issues per industry and only investing in firms that outperform their industry on, on those material ESG factors. So picking the, the firms to invest in that have the best ESG performance uh, compared to their industry competitors. Now, that might mean choosing firms that are in the top half of ESG performance or in the top third or in the top 20%. It depends on the, the particular investor. But to, to some degree, they're trying to choose the best ESG performers in each industry to invest in. And investors using that approach are, are investing almost uh, $2 trillion in assets. Norms-based screening refers to investing in firms that meet some minimum standard in terms of their ESG performance in their industry. So for example, um, in the fossil fuel industry, a common measure of, um, of uh, environmental performance is the amount of carbon emissions that the firm emits for every dollar of revenue earned. So if a, a firm that emits less emissions for every dollar earned is considered more efficient and a better environmental performer than a firm that emits a lot more than the industry average in terms of uh, every dollar earned. So norms-based screening is setting a kind of a minimum floor of performance that's per, uh, expected in each industry on material ESG issues and, and selecting firms for investment that do better than that minimum standard. And almost $5 trillion is invested using that approach. ESG integration it's, is a more vague category. It, it's very similar to the, in, the definition of sustainable investing. It just means that in one way or another, the investor includes ESG performance information into their decision-making process. How they do that can, can vary widely. And um, 17.5 trillion is invested with some sort of ESG integration approach. Then there's sustainability themed investing. This is investing in particular, particular industries and firms um, that are really aimed at resolving some sort of environmental or social issues. So perhaps only investing in clean energy or only investing in wind energy, or only investing in organic food firms, or um, only investing in auto manufacturers who make electric cars, and things like that. So it's, it's more specific investment in industries and firms that are clearly targeted um, at better environmental performance. So that's sustainability-themed investing, and about a trillion dollars is invested that way. Then there's impact or community investing, and that's where the investor is usually investing in, in resolving some local issue in a particular um, region. 
Um, so that might be investing in low-income housing to um, resolve the homelessness issue here in Victoria, for example. So it's much more targeted investing. And, in, and for impact and community investing, the investors are often willing to make a trade-off between financial performance and social or environmental benefits. Um, with these other types of investments, often the, the investor, you know, they, they, want, they want to have profits. And many times they want to have profits that are no less than had they invested in, in, a, in the broad market. But with impact and community investing, uh, investors are usually willing to accept um, a, a sub par or maybe even a slight loss in, in terms of their return on investment in exchange for certain social and environmental benefits mm -hmm. that they're after. Um, and then there's corporate engagement and shareholder action. This means that the, the investor owns the stock, um, but they engage directly with the corporation to try to, to convince them to improve their ESG performance. Um, so maybe they, they uh, make shareholder resolutions to ask the company to uh, report on how it's uh, managing the issue of climate change for its business, for example. And about $10 trillion uh, is invested by investment firms that do engage in shareholder action to, to push firms to be um, more sustainable. So these are the seven strategies, and investors tend to you know, mix and match them uh, to, to suit their own vision and capabilities to create uh, their own specific and sustainable investment strategy. So on to the, the evidence. What, what does research say about doing this? Usually people want to know, um, is there a trade-off um, in terms of less financial performance for better sustainability performance. Um, the first study here, um, this is done uh, at Oxford University about five years ago. And what they did in this study, it's called a meta-study. It's where they look at all the research on a certain topic. In this case, they're looking at all the research out there on the, on the topic of this relationship between sustainability performance and financial performance. And they're, they're summing up what that body of research tells us. So what the body of research on the relationship between sustainability and financial performance tells us is that there's a strong positive relationship between sustainability performance and financial performance. 88% uh, of research shows that firms with a solid ESG or sustainability practices um, have better operational performance. 90% of studies show that um, firms with sound sustainability standards have a lower cost of capital. In other words, banks are willing to lend to them at a lower interest rate because they see firms with sound sustainability performance as being less risky. Okay? That's important. Any of you who've ever taken out a loan knows that 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 interest rate is important. And if you're seen as being less risky because you're more responsible in terms of your sustainability performance, then banks and, and insurance companies um, will give you better rates. And finally, 80% of studies show that stock price performance is positively influenced by good sustainability performance. So contrary to the common belief that to get better sustainability performance, we have to sacrifice financial performance, that's not what the vast um, uh, amount of research shows us. This is looking at over 190 different studies on this topic. Um, next, I'm going to show you another piece of research. It's done by accounting professors at Harvard Business School. Um, that's a fairly reputable school. Um, and it's published in one of the top um, peer-reviewed academic journals in business. Our, our journals are ranked in terms of their quality, one to four. And four are the highest quality journals. They're the most difficult journals 
to get published in um, because the standards of, uh, uh, of rigorous research are so high there. And this is published in one of those journals um, by Harvard professors of accounting. So these are not your typical hippie guys, right? <laughs> Um, what they did in this is they, they looked at 180 large corporations across multiple industries over a period of 18 years. So they compared companies of a similar size in the same industries. So we're looking at an apples to apples comparison. There's no point in comparing the sustainability performance of Microsoft to Nature's Path Foods. They're, they're entirely different. Um, but if we compare companies in the same industry and about the same size, these are, these are good comparisons. Um, and what they found was what they call high sustainability companies. They significantly outperform low sustainability companies in their same industries over the long term in stock price performance and other types of accounting performance. Basically, high sustainability companies outperform low sustainability for companies and every financial metric you could look at. So ROE is return on equity and, and ROA is return on assets. These are different kind of uh, accounting uh, ratios that investors like to look at. So knowing now that high sustainability companies outperform low sustainability companies, it's important to know, okay, well, what are the common characteristics of those high sustainable companies? If you know that, then when you're investing, you can look for these characteristics, and if they don't have them, then you know that it might not be a high sustainability company, and it might perform less or, or worse in, in terms of its financial performance. So high, high sustainability companies have board level responsibility for sustainability. They tie executive compensation to ESG performance. So when, when the executives of a company or managers of a company have a carrot dangling in front of them saying, you know, if you'll do this, if you'll improve performance in this area, you'll, we'll pay you more, they often do their best. Um, you know, my 12 years of management experience have, have borne that out as well. Um, if you incentivize people to, to have certain behaviors, they often move in that direction, and it's no different with this. If executives are uh, compensated for better ESG performance, they go out there and get it. These companies have formal stakeholder engagement processes, so they're listening to the, to the constituents and stakeholders that they deal with to understand what issues are important with them and, and how they can uh, better address those issues for their stakeholders. And these companies measure and disclose through audited reports their ESG performance metrics. Um, when I see companies um, telling nice stories about what they've done or providing some data that's not audited, I just dismiss it. I, 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 I assume it's not valid at all. Um, but um, when, when they provide information that's audited and someone's career is on the line, um, if they've falsified those statements or documents, then I, I take it more seriously. And it's no different here. Um, when companies report on their ESG performance and they've got a measurable way of evaluating that performance and it's audited, um, then we can rely on that information much more. And these companies have long-term oriented strategies and performance targets, and their investors also take more long-term uh, views to investing. So these... You know, these can apply to any type of firm. Within industries, there'll be other specific things that they're doing, particularly in terms of which ESG issues um, they'll measure performance on. Um, but these, these broad characteristics can apply to any type of firm, and usually we can go out and, and determine whether a, a firm actually um, exhibits these characteristics or not. 
This is another piece of research, um, also by one of those Harvard accounting professors. Um, and what they were trying to look at is the, uh, the stock price performance of firms that uh, have high performance on material ESG issues versus firms that have uh, high performance on other types of ESG issues, but not ones that are considered material, compared to firms that don't have high performance on either material or immaterial issues. Um, what, I, what I mean by immaterial issues um, is when firms are doing something in regard to sustainability that wouldn't be important to their investors and that is unlikely to, uh, to, in a significant way, affect the financial performance of that firm in the short, medium, or long term. So, for example, when a mining company donates money to the opera, that might be important. We might enjoy that they've done, they made that donation and we get to enjoy the opera, but the opera has nothing to do with mining. It doesn't matter um, how much money uh, a mining company gives to a, an opera in terms of their environmental or social uh, impact in the, in the areas affected by their mines. So, so such donations could be considered an immaterial um, ESG performance or, or activity. Where, whereas if the, if the mining firm is ensuring that they're not polluting water in the watershed where their mine is, that, that is very material to, to the mine. If they pollute water, they can face regulatory uh, sanctions, they might face protests, they could even have their mine shut down. This could be very material to the investors. Okay? So, and what this research shows us is firms that only perform well on immaterial uh, ESG issues, they outperform the market in terms of investment returns, but only very slightly, by just over half a percent. Meanwhile, firms that only perform well on material ESG issues outperform the market by 6%. Firms that perform poorly on both material and immaterial issues underperform the market by almost 3%. And firms that perform well on both material and immaterial ESG issues, they also outperform the market but just by 2% compared to firms that only perform well on material ESG issues, who outperform by 6%. Um, so in a nutshell, this tells us firms are better off remaining focused on improving their performance on the material ESG issues for their industry. Finally, this is some very recent research that was published in Harvard Business Review and it's, it's evidence that firms that manage with a long-term perspective outperform firms with a, a, a all, or all other firms, all other types of firms um, on, on a variety of different financial metrics. Um, so revenue, the, the blue line is firms with a long-term uh, management approach. They're, they're outperforming in terms of uh, revenue oh, since about uh, 11 years ago. Um, they're outperforming in terms of average earnings also since about 10 years ago. They're outperforming in terms of profit since, since the turn of the century and they're outperforming in terms of market capitalization or the, the size of the market that they, they take up um, over the last 11 years. And, and firms that have a long-term view are more likely to take into account issues like climate change. And they're, they're, gonna look, uh, they're gonna look forward at how society and regulators uh, is gonna react to climate change and they're gonna position themselves uh, to perform well in that future when, when we're trying to do something to, to limit warming. So this is, this is the research. This is what research tells us about the relationship between financial and, and ESG performance. 
So now the, the big challenge is to know what are those material ESG issues by industry and how do we measure that performance. Um, fortunately, there's been a, a very good organization working on answering that question for us. It's called the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. It's a nonprofit organization in the U.S. And um, groups from industry um, and regulators and academia and uh, NGOs that look to pr protect environment and, and, or human rights, they all work together to identify what the material ESG issues are, industry by industry, and identify how to measure performance on each of those issues. Um, this work um, started in about uh, 2009 or ish, um, and by about 2016, um, they had done the work for 84 different industries. So across 84 different industries, they've identified the material ESG uh, issues per industry and how to perform, or sorry, how to measure performance on each of those issues. So now we have a tool that we can use to, to figure out what's important to measure and how to measure this for each industry. Um, I'm going to show you basically the tool that they, or part of the tool um, that, that uh, we can use to, to identify material issues and how to measure them. On the SASB website, which there's a link to there, um, you can find what's called a materiality map. And it's basically a matrix that shows us industry by industry what the issues are. Um, it looks for potential uh, material impacts across 26 sustainability issues. Uh, this was when I made the 79 industries. I think they're up to 84 now. Um, and they divide these sustainable issues into uh, five dimensions. Environmental, social, uh, social capital, human capital, business models and innovation, and leadership and governance. So under each of those five dimensions, there are a number of different issues um, that, that might affect any one industry. And this is what the materiality map looks like. So I've, uh, I've expanded the section here on the extractives and mineral processing uh, sector. Um, and any of these cells that are uh, colored in dark gray uh, mean that this is a material issue uh, for this industry. So in the oil and gas and services industry, GHG emissions is a material issue. And then uh, if, it's, if it's blank or white, that's not considered to be an, a material issue for the industry. So access and affordability is not considered to be a material issue in the, in the extractive and mineral processing industry. You can see over there, here though, um, in the healthcare industry, Access and affordability is considered to be a material issue. So we see that you've got different issues that are important uh, for different industries. So that tells us what's an important issue at a high level. Um, but if you click on that cell, then it'll, it'll give you more information. Um, and it'll show you, um, again, still at a fairly high level, uh, how they describe the performance metric or how they measure this performance. Um, so for this, this is the accounting metric for greenhouse gas emissions in the oil and gas exploration and production industry. And this metric is the amount of uh, gross global scope one emissions um, from flared hydrocarbons, other combustion process emissions, other vented emissions, and fugitive emissions. Um, this is still a, a fairly high level description of the metric, um, but in another part of the SASB system, what they call the standards navigator, um, you can find extremely detailed instructions about how to make these measurements. They're really written for the practitioner who's gonna have to work in this business and go out and, and gather that data. Uh, you have to pay for that information, but um, 
but this level of information through the materiality map is available for free. So now we know. We, we, we know that ESG performance drives financial performance, and we know how to find what's materially important in terms of ESG performance for every industry and how to measure that performance. So if you're looking at a firm that's not um, sharing information about how it's measuring these material ESG issues for its industry, I wouldn't trust them. That tells me they are not managing these issues in a responsible way. I want to see them reporting on these issues in an audited way, and I want them to explain how they're managing those issues to improve their performance over the medium and long term. If they're not doing that, I would also claim they're not doing their fiduciary duty as a manager. Managers have the fiduciary duty to make sure that they're, they're managing their firm in a way that's ensuring its, its success in the long term. If we know that firms that perform poorly on these material issues perform poorly financially, then these are things that the management should be managing. Um, and they should explain to their investors how they're managing it. Um, so if, if they're not doing that, beware. Um, so finally, here's the example that um, our students um, who won this uh, case competition at the World Economic Forum came up with. Basically, the, the um, Norwegian Global Pension Fund, which is, uh, has about, at that time, had about $900 billion to invest, they want to um, create a portfolio that will perform uh, as well as or better than the market in terms of financial performance, but also be designed so that it will be aligned with the goal of limiting uh, global warming to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius. So in other words, the emissions of all the companies that they invest in, when you take them together, need to drop by somewhere between 70 and 95% by 2050 in order to meet those targets. So we can, we can determine, we can estimate uh, fairly accurately what the emissions of an investment portfolio are. We can see where the big, em big emitters are. We can look in those industries and we can identify the best and the worst performers. And we can use this information to create a portfolio that's gonna have reduced emissions over time. Um, these are just some some pictures from, from Davos. These are, this is the winning team here. Um, we got to do a little bit of skiing while we were there. That was nice. Um, we, we met some important people. Um, th this is my student here, Bupinder. Uh, and, and this is their framework. Basically, the, what they do um, is for every potential investment, they evaluate it on five different factors. Um, and they give it a score um, on each of these uh, different factors, a score between uh, one and five. So first they look at the, the financial health of the company, um, basically the short-term financial health um, based on its net worth and its debt to equity ratio. Um, and they'll compare that to averages in the industry to determine how they see its performance on a scale of one to five, five being the best. Then they look at um, ESG positioning of the industry that the firm is in. Um, so they look at, at nine different areas in sustainability that are faced by all industries, and they, they rank how, how that the ESG performance of that industry is compared to other industries. Um, so your, your clean energy uh, sector uh, might get a really high score here and your coal sector might get a really low score, for example. Then they look at the, the risk return of that investment uh, on a, 
on a, in a financial basis, and they're looking at how risky is that investment within its industry, and also what's the, what is the risk of the whole portfolio? So when we combine all these investments together, how is the sum total of their risks uh, looking? If we invest in this, is it creating more or less risk for our portfolio? Then they look at the future value, really future financial value for that stock or that investment. So they're looking at the, the prospects for financial growth for that company um, in the medium and long term. And finally, externalities refers to that, that company's performance within its own industry in regard to uh, sustainability. So what they're going to look at there is what are the material ESG issues in the industry of this firm and how is that company performing uh, relative to other companies in that industry on those material ESG issues. So they, they rank each potential, or they rate each potential investment across these five um, different categories and they add up the scores from these five categories um, the highest score being 25. They know that these companies in the 17 to 25 range, um, they've, they've got pretty strong scores across all these dimensions. Those are clearly things that they would want to invest in. At the other end of the scale, companies that are only getting a score of 0 to 8 are at the low end of the scale. You want to stay away from those for sure. And companies in this 9 to 16 range are somewhere in between. Uh, so they might choose to invest in them, um, particularly if they see that the company is, is moving towards better performance in the future. Or there might be an investment where they feel like they could engage with that company as a shareholder, maybe join other shareholders in creating uh, shareholder resolutions that could push that company to improve its ESG performance. Um, so using this approach, the students put together um, a portfolio um, for, um, for the Norwegian Pension Fund. And when they then looked at how that portfolio performed over the past uh, five and 10 years, um, it significantly outperformed the, the standard uh, investment benchmarks over that same period. It also um, had drastically lower carbon emissions than, than the market or the uh, standard portfolio. So that's it in a nutshell. I've got more that I can share. I can go into greater detail, um, but I think it's a good time to open up for questions. Thank you, it was Thanks. very interesting. Thank you.